which is kind of an introduction to me. Um, the funny thing is uh, several, so I am a revert to Islam, by the way. I've been a Muslim for five years now, alhamdulillah. And um, I think within my first, say, six months of uh, becoming a Muslim, this brother comes to me one day and he says to me, brother, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a naturopathic doctor and I explained what that is. And he kind of looked at me and he said, oh, that's kind of like a, like a sunnah doctor. I'm like, what's a sunnah doctor? And then he explained to me what the sunnah is. And I thought, well, it kind of sounds up my alley. This is really awesome. I didn't even know this was part of our religion. I want to learn more. And uh, so I started to learn uh, more about sunnah medicine and trying to apply it in my, in my work. And it's funny because every time this brother would see me, he'd yell and say, hey, the sunnah doctor is here. And so the, the name kind of stuck. And uh, <laughs> when I decided to enter full-time clinical practice again, I decided, well, I want to help the ummah as much as possible. So I'll call myself the sunnah doctor. So there you go. Um, is this unique, this prophetic medicine, is this unique to Islam? Absolutely. In fact, uh, as a former Christian, this is one of the things which is, uh, I think, very interesting for me, that <clears throat> as Muslims, we are blessed with this unique knowledge. No other religion in the world has within its scripture and its religious teachings um, ways to uh, improve your life in terms of you know, nutritional advice, lifestyle advice. These are specific only to Islam that we have these blessings. And uh, you know, what an amazing thing that that is. Um, in terms of is it applicable today, well, uh, I would say that the closer we align ourselves to the sunnah, um, the healthier and happier that we are. And definitely the scientific community are listening to this. They're uh, taking this topic on board. This is uh, sunnah medicine or prophetic medicine wisdom is being investigated and researched around the world, not just in Muslim majority countries. Um, a really good example of this is a study I came across recently, which was looking at <clears throat> looking at all the wisdom uh, surrounding oral health, the health of our mouth, uh, from the Sunnah and its scientific um, accuracy. And that research basically proved that if we were to follow the, wis the wisdom from the Sunnah in terms of oral hygiene, we would have hygienic mouths and, and better dental health and periodontal disease, etc. So I think personally that being health focused and wellness focused is part of the Muslim identity um, because it's something that we've been taught since the beginning. And, uh, you know, we have this unique opportunity to learn more. So Bismillah. Um, obviously, when we talk about health, you can't not talk about foods. As a lecturer of mine said once, you know, whatever goes into your body is going to affect your body. And so obviously food is a very crucial thing. And this first quote up here, let food be your medicine, it's not specifically Islamic at all. In fact, it's, it comes from a guy called Hippocrates, who is um, <clears throat> considered to be the father of Western medicine. He was an ancient Greek. Um, and um, uh, he essentially taught this principle that let food be your medicine and medicine be your food. Dr. And he went on to see that. Sorry to interrupt, yes. but are you sharing a screen? If you are, we're not seeing it. Oh, you're not seeing it? You should no. be. Have a look here. You can't see that? Let's have a look what's going on. Excuse me, everyone. Let's have a look. Oh, yeah, actually, you're right. I think it, uh, it dropped off. Let me do that again. <clears throat> okay, is that better? Uh, no, we're not seeing the screen. Hmm. Okay. It might be because we're hosts. Can everyone else see the screen? I can see. I can see Dr. Idris, but I can't see. Are you, are you meant to be sharing something or are we just meant to be seeing your face? No, you don't want to see my face. <laughs> Did you click on the share um, with the arrow? Yeah, yeah, it's happening. It's. Um... Mm. Now it's happening. Okay. My apologies, everyone. 
there's always some type of technical problem, right? <laughs> Comes with Can you term. see that now? Yes. All right, excellent. Well, you didn't miss out on much. I was just showing you this screen here and this one here, which talks about uh, had those questions. Um, you'll find that with these slides tonight, there's some information on the left and there's a hadith on the right. Um, so as I was saying, uh, I was kind of introducing the topic of food and talking about Hippocrates and uh, this concept of uh, let food be your medicine and medicine be your food. In fact, he went on to say that if you cannot fix your problem from what you eat, then go and see a doctor. And I wish that my patients did this because <laughs> this is a very common thing. People will come into my clinic and they'll sit down and they say, listen, brother, listen, I know that I've got a bad diet. I'm like, well, fix your diet, you know. <laughs> Maybe that's why they're coming to see me. I don't know. But um, essentially, we want to try and eat a rainbow of food. Uh, the more colorful your plate is, uh, the more it represents all of the phytonutrients and chemistry that this um, you know, that our vegetation and uh, food has to offer. This, uh, this hadith is a very important one because I think this is one of the biggest problems that we face as humans. In fact, uh, there is another hadith that mentions, it says something along the lines of that the children of Adam do not feel any vessel greater than their, than, than their stomachs. And I'm, I'm sure that we can all relate to this. Uh, this particular hadith, however, mentions that we should not eat until being full. Uh, and again, getting back to my, my clinical practice, you know, it's a very common thing. People will come in and say, Wallah, brother, Wallah, I'm always bloated all the time. And I think to myself, well, maybe that's because you eat too much all the time. You know, you're always filling that stomach up. Um, we should, in fact, eat a third, fill a, a third of our stomach with food, a third with water, and we should leave a third of it empty for air. This is the, um, this is the teachings uh, from the Sunnah. We should definitely try and eat slowly. A lot of us are not really connected and mindful when we eat. We kind of just chow it down. Um, and this is another little beautiful um, uh, note here that we're taught in the Sunnah, that we should not eat alone. We should always try and eat with others. For example, you know, I had a situation once where I was in a fairly quiet cafe and uh, it was a halal, a small halal cafe, and another brother walked in and I noticed that he was by himself. I was by myself. So I invited him to sit with me. And you know what? It was a wonderful experience. We had such a great communication and we made friends. Um, and uh, another thing that we're taught from the Sunnah is to not criticize your food or the food of others, I should say, too. If you don't like it, as was the uh, the practice of our Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, just simply don't eat it. Um, so these are some of the things when it comes to the, the habits of food. Now we're going to look at uh, food itself. And interestingly, I'm sure that this will be a little bit of a surprise to most of you tonight. One of the favorite pro, uh, the food, one of our the favorite foods of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was pumpkin. He loved pumpkin, and as noted in this hadith. Uh, that uh, there was a, a dish of barley bread and soup containing some meat and pumpkin. And he went and ate all the pumpkin. And so clearly that's one of his favorite foods. Um, pumpkin is an excellent food. And unfortunately, we don't eat it enough. We kind of just leave it for pumpkin soups or the occasional uh, melody of uh, you know roast veggies. But it's extremely high in an antioxidant called beta carotene, which converts into your body as vitamin A. Vitamin A, of course, is excellent for the eyes and for skin, um, for immunity, cancer prevention. And it also has an interesting ingredient here called tryptophan. Tryptophan is the amino acid precursor um, of serotonin. And if you know what serotonin is, serotonin is that chemical in the body that makes us happy. So it fights depression and helps to fight insomnia. Um, and so pumpkin, uh, excellent things, which, you know, really there's so many uses for pumpkin. So hopefully we all start eating a little bit more, uh, using or going off the same, um, hadith here, we can see that, uh, the bread that was, uh, that the prophet himself, Salah Salam ate all the uh, Sahaba at the time they ate, um, their bread was made from barley. And I'm sure none of us have probably ever had barley bread. Um, barley itself, if you were to compare it in terms of nutrition uh, of barley compared to wheat, 
is is totally on a different league on its own. Um, barley is kind of like the super grain, if we can say that. It's very high in fiber. It promotes gut health. It does not bloat. It doesn't cause you know gut problems. Um, it uh, it does prevent diabetes. It's known to assist with weight loss, and it's very high in antioxidants. And um, another really cool thing about barley is barley helps to um, promote more energy, in fact, much more energy than, say, wheat would. And I know that we've probably all had this feeling where we've had a big bowl of pasta or maybe a, a sandwich or something like that, and we've just kind of got that, you know, that carb dull. We've, we've overdone the carbs from the wheat, and we just feel that, like, you could use a little nap. Barley won't do that. Barley's excellent for promoting energy. So why don't we all try and make some barley bread? Uh, barley is readily available. Um, and next uh, food item here is grapes. Grapes are mentioned 11 times in the Quran. Um, and there are several hadith that talk about the benefits of grapes. The, um, the chemical that we're interested in, and the naturally occurring chemical in grapes is actually found in the skin of grapes. And this chemical is called resveratrol. Um, it's an amazing antioxidant. Um, it has unbelievable anti-aging qualities, not just for skin, but, you know, all of the facets of health. It has amazing anti-cancer properties. Um, it's excellent for heart health. Um, it prevents various cancers. And like I said, uh, uh, or sorry, I didn't say, this particular ingredient, resveratrol, is also shown to have amazing cognitive abilities. So if you're struggling with your memory or your kids um, are struggling at school and you want to help to improve brain health, grapes are actually an amazing choice. So there's no surprise that Honey is, is on this list. I think most of us know that honey is a traditional food from the Sunnah. Um, however, honey, uh, you know, has so many uses. This hadith I like for a few reasons. It talks about how someone came um, uh, with some abdominal trouble and the Prophet <clears throat> said, let him eat. Uh, sorry, let him drink honey. Um, and uh, if you read this whole hadith, it talks about how he drank it three times and then finally uh, he was healed. Um, it kind of illustrates two things to me. Number one, don't expect that you just have a teaspoon of honey once and all your problems are solved. You know, this is something with, that we should in include in our daily regime and, um, and, and you know, uh, come using it on a regular basis is going to give us better um, outcomes. Honey uh, is amazing for the gut, as it illustrates from this hadith. Um, it's also got antimicrobial benefits, antimicrobial meaning that it's going to kill the, the germs that we don't want, like bacteria or fungus or parasites. Um, it definitely fights infections. And, of course, as we know, particularly during this cold winter uh, season that we're experiencing. It's great for immunity and colds and coughs, etc. However, what you might not know is that honey is undergoing some research and interests with neurological diseases. Uh, they're looking at it with mood disorders like anxiety and depression. It's used uh, for wound healing and it's also used for skin health. So honey is such a versatile, um, simple thing really when you think about it, but it's uh, amazing. Um, in terms of its benefits. Another favorite food from the Sunnah um, is watermelon. Now, watermelon is high in citrulline, which is awesome for hypertension. In fact, you'll see a lot of things here today are excellent for um, problems that are very common amongst the Muslim ummah. And this is always why I, I don't understand why we have so many of these problems within our community. Um, because there are so many things here which, if you apply to them, you know, for example, hypertension, high cholesterol, diabetes, most of these problems are, um, are definitely uh, treatable, they're reversible, and, and I would even say definitely preventable. 
Um, lycopene is an ingredient in watermelon. It's also found in other things like tomatoes, for example. Excellent for energy production, for bone health, for skin pigment. It's, it's good for the male libido. And uh, I want to give you a real life example how you could use watermelon. So imagine you've spent the day for the people here in Melbourne, you've you spent the day at Chadston, all right? You've had a chatty day and you've been walking around Chadston doing some shopping with your family and you know that feeling you get when you just get that. You've been in this, you know, this large complex with hundreds of people, the air is recirculated, you, you know, you feel fatigued, your feet are tired and you just want a little pick me up. Get a fresh watermelon juice. Trust me, you're going to feel awesome within a few minutes because watermelon is a great pick-me-up. It's an excellent hydrator. Excellent foods um, when you're breaking your fast after Ramadan. So, in fact, it's one of the ones I always try and have with my iftar before I eat my meal. So um, watermelon, again, excellent food. Cucumbers, as you can see, these are specifically hard to source or you know, um, complex things here. We're talking about stuff that uh, we have access to all the all of the time, pretty much. Cucumbers, humble cu cucumbers are very high in electrolytes. They're a great hydrator. Again, great for hypertension, which is which means high blood pressure. Um, can assist with diabetes and skin and gut health. And uh, cucumber is one of these because it's got such a high water content, and because of the nutrition inside it. It's an excellent veggie to juice. So if you wanted to make, and I kind of, you know, I do recommend this to people, get into juicing. It's an excellent way to start your day. And add cucumbers. You know, you can change it up by adding different combinations of fruit and veggies. But cucumber is um, just a great addition to any juice. Um, olives. As this hadith mentions, uh, this is a blessed tree. And it says here that we should season our food with olive oil and anoint yourselves with it. And I think the word anoint here really indicates that we should use it topically. We should apply it to our skin. Um, olive oil is just by itself an excellent thing to apply topically to the skin. If you have dry skin <clears throat> or rashes or eczema or anything like that. Um, olives and particularly olive oil when it's raw, meaning when it's uncooked, uh, has an amazing ability to balance the omega ratios, our ratio between omega 3s and 6, which is very important for health. It's uh, great for managing cholesterol. It's excellent for heart health. And uh, because it's a great source of um, healthy fats, it's really good for memory. And it helps, recent research shows it helps to prevent um, dementia and Alzheimer's. Vinegar. Um, in this hadith, it's mentioned that um, vinegar was used at a, as a condiment, and there are several hadith that mention vinegar. In fact, uh, a lot of them refer to uh, the prophet and the companions uh, dipping the bread, their bread, into the vinegar as they ate their meal. So that's how they consumed it, I believe, in the most part. However, vinegar is... Um, it's been used around the world for centuries, um, for thousands of years, literally, as, as a form of medicine. And, um, and that's for good reason. Vinegar, when you buy vinegar, by the way, you always want to buy vinegar that is, regardless of what it's made from, whether it's made from apples or pears or anything else, um, uh, you want to try and find a vinegar that is, um, has that cloudiness. You don't want it to be clear. The cloudiness is where all the goodness is. And um, what we know today is vinegar is amazing for your gut. And I'll just pause here for a second and explain the importance of the gut cannot be understated. And I'm sure that most of you, if you've ever had gut problems, you know this. When your gut doesn't work right, you just don't work right yourself. The gut is essentially, um, it's connected to our mood. Uh, there's a, something called the brain-gut axis. Another very important thing about um, the gut is about 70% of our total body immunity is actually from the gut. Um, so, you know, looking after your gut is important and vinegar is one of the ways that you can do that. It helps to eliminate, in fact, probably a better term is it helps to balance the dysbiotic state, which is the state where you've got a competition between or a war between your good and your bad bacteria. 
It helps to eliminate those pathogens, those harmful bacteria. Um, and there are so many, um, so many uses for vinegar. I mean, using it on head lice or dandruff or warts on the skin. Um, it's really good to get rid of body odor. Um, for example, you know, if you if you're having body odor problems, you want to consume vinegar internally and even use it topically on your skin um, before you shower. Um, but something I would recommend, because again, as we said, gut problems are quite common in our community. Um, apple cider vinegar there. Uh, try having a tablespoon in a glass of water before meals. This is a very old fashioned thing. This is nothing new. Um, but uh, the having the apple cider vinegar, vinegar diluted in water and having it by, before a meal has been shown in studies to be um, so beneficial for so many things. It helps to decrease your, you know, your hunger so that you don't overeat in the first place. It definitely helps to spike your bile um, and enzymes in your, that are you know, in your gut. They're waiting to be used to break down your food. And it basically helps to improve digestion. And in most cases, if you suffer from acid reflux, most, not all, it will generally help to stop that acid reflux or GERD uh, symptoms. Again, uh, no surprise here, <clears throat> pardon me, that we have uh, dates on the list. Um, I was actually having a conversation um, last night uh, about this topic, how uh, Saudis love dates. And um, look, uh, this particular hadith talks about uh, Ajwa dates in particular, which are a small <clears throat> kind of a drier black uh, date. Um, there are many. Uh, Ajwa dates in this hadith, however, uh, help us to protect against uh, magic and poison. Dates on their own, though, regardless of the type, are uh, uh, just a fuel-packed, highly nutritious food. Very high in fiber. On the glycemic index, they're low, um, so they don't really throw up our um, blood sugar. And then a very interesting um, note here, this is, again, showing how foods from the Sunnah are finding their way into um, the rest of the world, that... Um, naturopaths and nutritionists and midwives now start recommending that uh, if you're in your third trimester of pregnancy that you should eat um, several dates a day and that helps to promote and assist um, childbirth and this interestingly is also uh, noted in Surah Maryam I was having a conversation with a Christian once about um, how we're very fortunate as Muslims to have uh, so much more information about um, about Maryam and um, uh, Nabi Isa. Peace and blessings be upon them both. And um, how in this surah it talks about the use of dates and how Allah Azawajal provided dates um, to aid her in the delivery of uh, Isa. So moving on from the Sunnah foods, I hope that you've learned uh, some interesting things there. We're going to be starting to talk about Sunnah herbs. And um, the first one, of course, has to be black seed. I think every Muslim in the world knows that black seed, and particularly this hadith that says that black seed is a shifa, a healing for a cure for all disease except death, which is an amazing hadith. Um, <clears throat> and it's actually because black seed itself is amazing. We still researching and finding new applications and uses for this amazing um, herb. Uh, essentially, it's a very, it has a very rich chemistry. And one of the key chemicals I'd like to introduce you to tonight is called thymoquinine. When you buy black seed, it's ideal that you know the, the company, hopefully they tell you the thymoquinine content of the oil that you're buying. And that's because that's one of the main chemicals that we research and we understand some of its benefits and uses. Um, it has anti-cancer properties, and I literally mean literally anti-cancer properties. It helps to induce something called apoptosis, which is the cell death of cancer cells. Essentially, in a very basic way, that's what chemotherapy tries to do. Um, anti-diabetic in nature, it's used in um, anti-diabetic um, herbal formulas. And uh, thymoquine itself is uh, highly antimicrobial, meaning that it helps to <clears throat> target 
bacteria and viruses and other pathogens. So uh, an amazing ingredient, and, and surely that's why we can see um, it's mentioned in, in this hadith. Aloe vera um, is uh, mentioned here as uh, it was used for an aff uh, afflicted eye. And uh, aloe vera can come in several forms. So it's basically uh, a, a plant. Uh, you can grow it in your backyard, actually. It grows here in Australia. Um, and it has this beautiful, beautiful gel interior. So that gel you can use directly on the skin um, for anything that's irritated your skin, whether it be sunburn, eczema, rashes, bug bites. Um, I don't put anything on my skin except um, aloe vera. Um, uh, you know, I think it's a guy thing. I'm not into using creams and lotions and potions and stuff, but um, I'll hop out of the shower and I'll just put some aloe vera gel on my face. I've been doing it for, for years. Um, and then, of course, aloe vera also comes in a powdered version or a juice version. Um, and the juice of the inner leaf is what we want. This is used essentially mostly for gut things. Um, it's amazing to calm an irritated gut and inflammation. If you have gastritis, it would be brilliant for that. And uh, it's useful for calming, as I said, an upset gut, IBS, et cetera. Um, this is one which most of you have probably not heard of, Kustos Hindi uh, or Indian Kustos. It's originally from India. It also grows in China. And uh, in this hadith, uh, it talks about the use for um, essentially lung infection slash tonsillitis. Um, that's how we can probably, um, you know, look at it in today's uh, vernacular. Um, it's highly antimicrobial, um, antibacterial, antifungal, antiparasitic. And um, for this reason, it's excellent for anything to do with the like ear, nose, throat, lungs. When you've got excessive phlegm, when you've got congestion, when you've got infection, nasal congestion. So it's got a lot of uses. It is available. You can find it. Um, and, uh, and there we have um, uh, a hadith that talks about the use here of Kustas Hindi. So I'd like to move on now to some simple lifestyle things which we learn from the Sunnah. Uh, it's excellent to incorporate the foods of the Sunnah and the herbs of the Sunnah, but you know, incorporating a lifestyle is just as helpful. Uh, and the first one here, which I guess many of you probably do know about, is hijama. Um, hijama, of course, is wet cupping. It did not originate with the Arabs, um, but it's been practiced for thousands of years uh, by the Chinese. And um, this particular hadith mentions that uh, there is healing in cupping and the best of your treatments is cupping. There's two hadiths here. And um, look, uh, cupping is an excellent thing to do, um, I think, probably at least every three months. Um, it's a, in itself is a detoxification and improved circulation. It's brilliant for inflammation and pain. I try to get cupped at least, you know, um, probably at least twice a year. And um, one of the good things, if you, good, if you see a really good uh, hijama therapist, they will teach you that, you know, before you get cupping done, uh, you should be in a state of wudu and you should have uh, basically not had anything to eat for a couple hours before. And then after your cupping, you should reintroduce food slowly back into your life. So um, most hijama therapists recommend to ease into um, animal proteins that you should start with vegetables, soups and juices and things like this. So the whole experience is, is excellent. And just imagine if you did that two, three, four times a year, the health benefits that are involved there. Miswak or Siwak, um, <laughs> I've got a really funny story about this actually. So um, when I became a brand new Muslim and I said my Shahada, uh, this brother comes up to me one day and we're going to pretend that this pen is uh, Siwak, okay? So he comes up to me and he says, brother, brother, mashallah, I want to say welcome to Islam. I want to give you something very special. And he gives me this thing and he holds, he gives it to me and it was a Siwak. I didn't know that at the time. And that's it. He didn't say what it was or how to use it. He says, brother, please enjoy. Very special. And then he left. And so for about a week, I had this stick in my pocket. I had no idea what it was used for. And um, that's it. I was just walking around with this twig in my pocket. Until one day, I saw a brother at the masjid going, you know, like, 
doing this and cleaning his teeth. I'm like, that's it. That's the stick. So I went up to him. I said, brother, what are you doing? And he said, oh, this is Miss Wap gets to brush your teeth. Um, I love Siwak. And, um, you know, uh, it's something which I think is so easy to do. And some people look at it and think of it as a little bit odd, but ultimately when you get into using it, you'll realise how awesome it is. Um, Miss Wack, in fact, again, another little story from the past. Uh, another brother that I met once, his name was Musa, and um, he was a, a big mashallah, uh, Palestinian brother. And he had done a, uh, he was a chemist, a chemical chemist, and he had done a, his master's degree and his uh, research project was looking at miswak and uh, the chemical uh, ingredients within it. And so what we know is that the chemistry of miswak is it works on periodontal disease, on gingivitis, on bad breath, it widens teeth, it prevents tooth decay, it's got, it helps with cavities, and it's just such a simple thing to do. Um, and as it says here in the Hadith, that Siwak is purifying for the mouth and pleasing to the Lord. So, um, inshallah, I hope that uh, at least uh, they're very easy to find, by the way. You just buy them online or from uh, your local Islamic bookshop. But such a simple yet, you know, excellent thing to include into your life. Sleep. Now, um, this is a very interesting hadith here. It says that the Prophet wasallam, uh, would dislike to sleep before Isha and to talk after it. Such a short but profound hadith. And none of us do this. I know that this is one of the plagues of our modern generation, that what we're learning here is that we should um, sleep shortly after Isha Rather than staying up until, you know, 11, 12, 1, 2. I mean, I've got people, I've got patients who tell me, you know, look, brother, I go to bed at 2 a.m. and I wake up for Fajr and I'm exhausted. I'm like, of course you're exhausted. You're not even getting sleep. Um, another thing that we learn from the Sunnah is that uh, having a short nap between Dhuhr and Asr is actually, again, it's an authentic Sunnah. Not all of us can do that, but it's if it's available to you, then that would be good. Um, I think we might all have to move to Italy or some country that they still do siestas. <laughs> um, and then another really important point is if you go to bed earlier, guess what? You can wake up for Fajr and you can start your day and you can be incredibly productive. This was the lifestyle of the Sahaba and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And, um, you know, it's such, again, such a simple thing, sleep. Um, so get your sleep, everyone. Fasting, of course, we know of the benefits of fasting during the Ramadan, but I will be uh, very, you know, I'd like to make a point here that fasting does not mean overeating for iftar. If you really wanted to fast, um, like we're taught in the Sunnah, then it would include the following. You would start off by having an incredibly small sahur and not skipping it because there's barka in sahur, but waking up on purpose and having a very small sahur. And some people, and I think this is where a bit of tradition and culture comes in, some people feel that they need to wake up like two hours before fajr. You don't. You can eat right up until you hear the sound of the adhan. Um, and, um, you know, there are um, benefits in having sahur, but keeping it very simple. In fact, my sahur is just like our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had, which is literally just dates and water. That's all I have. Um, and then, of course, we're fasting throughout the day. And when it comes for iftar, breaking that fast slowly. I cannot repeat the importance of this. Starting slowly. So I break my fast, again, with dates and water and normally some fresh cut fruits, um, you know, like watermelon, grapes, something that's really high in hydration. Then it's a really good time to go and pray Maghrib and then come back and enjoy your meal. Having that break between breaking your fast and eating your food, your solid food, um, uh, your meal, I should say, helps to not overeat. And this is the biggest problem uh, with Muslims during uh, Ramadan. Um, but fasting, of course, uh, it's a sunnah to fast on Mondays and Thursdays. Um, fasting has so many health benefits if you follow it correctly. 
And, like, it, and, and for those of, uh, you know, my patients and colleagues and friends who fast correctly, like I've just explained before, when you fast, you have an amazing time. Okay, it might be difficult in the very beginning, particularly during Ramadan, the first two, three days. But after you've finished your first week, I'm sure most of you know what I'm talking about. You feel amazing. So get back into the, the routine of fasting on Mondays and Thursdays. Um, a grateful heart is a very important um, part of what, you know, the, again, the Muslim identity should be. You know, every beat of your heart is because Allah Azawajal has allowed it. Filling your heart with uh, gratitude for Allah's blessings in your life, being grateful to your family. Um, this is a really beautiful one. Giving your salam to strangers. When's the last time you gave a salam to someone that you didn't know? We don't do it anymore. And this is actually, uh, this is mentioned in the Hadith uh, when it talks about the end of days, coming to the days of uh, the day of judgment, that people will stop salaming each other if they don't know each other. Uh, and don't forget that smiling, smiling is a sunnah. So um, a beautiful Hadith here that talks about these things. Minimalism. Um, our Prophet وسلم, was a minimalist, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and uh, we are taught to um, somewhat shun the luxuries of this life and enjoy a simple but pious life. I think that, um, you know, it's very difficult today to do that. Uh, we, we need cars and, and, and we enjoy our technology. I'm not saying that these things are bad, but minimal, minimalist when you can be, um, particularly in decluttering your life, decluttering your belongings. We, we, we own too many things these days. Um, decluttering your busy schedule, decluttering your debt, decluttering your mess, simplifying your life. Um, just some small, simple steps that you could help to be, uh, change to become more minimalist. Um, and you'll notice that most of your stress starts to kind of fall away. Um, being chari charitable, again, should be part of the Muslim identity. Um, I think that most of us have this mindset that to be charitable means that we donate to a charity online or we pay for our qurban in some country we've never heard of before. Um, being charitable can, you know, really can also start in, in your, on your um, front doorstep. Definitely people that suffer from anxiety or negative thinking or depression, they can completely alleviate their um, uh, these thoughts by being charitable. The more you give to others, whether it's your time or your wealth or whatever, the more blessed you feel, and that alleviates your anxiety and your stresses. Um, feeding the less fortunate. There are people in our communities, our next door neighbours, who might be going under very difficult financial times, visiting sick or aged people, planting trees. Um, there's a beautiful hadith that talks about the barqa, the blessing in planting trees, cleaning someone's home. You know, you might have a, a neighbour who you don't know very well. You know that she's old or he's old and, 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 and um, maybe by themselves. Offer to do some service to them, cut their grass, um, do some house cleaning. We've got an enormous amount of international students here in this country. Have you ever thought of hosting one? It doesn't even need to be in your home. Invite them to a coffee or share a meal. Um, a, a traveler. Uh, these are, the, you know, this is again part of the identity of being a Muslim, and we found we, we're taught from the Sunnah. Now we're going to uh, conclude on this topic, which are things that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not like, and uh, the first one is. I'm sorry for all those people that love their, especially uh, our dear uh, um, Lebanese, <laughs> I'm going to pick on the Lebanese tonight, that love their garlic dip. Um, uh, our prophet did not like garlic or onion. And I will be mindful that it was specifically raw. Uh, in this hadith, it mentions that uh, he forbade us uh, for eating garlic and onions and said, he who wants them should not come near the mosque. If it is necessary to eat them, make them dead by cooking. And that is onions and garlic. That's a very strong hadith there. Um, and um, essentially, yes, if we're consuming garlic and onion raw, we shouldn't attend the masjid. That's the, the teachings from the sunnah here. And just as another interesting point here, a lot of the Buddhists throughout the world do not consume onion or garlic at all. 
Um, it's considered um, uh, for different reasons. We know that onions and garlic have medicinal purposes, yes, but um, this was one of the things that is not liked um, uh, by our prophet. Sleeping on your stomach. Um, I used to do this and I've changed. Uh, Alhamdulillah, I'm now a right. I sleep on my right and then I kind of find in the morning I've turned and, and I'm, I wake up on my back. Um, an amazing change. And um, look, uh, sleeping on your stomach in some schools of thought, you know, is a sign that there's a problem. Um, uh, people normally sleep on their on their stomachs if they have issues um, that they're trying to alleviate. However, uh, the problems are generally caused because you sleep on your stomach. So sleeping on your stomach definitely puts pressure on your th entire thoracic cavity, which includes your heart and your gut. Um, you obviously it's going to disturb your digestion. It definitely increases acid reflux. Uh, you can cause neck pain, back pain, hip, etc. If you have sleep apnea, you might not even know if you have sleep apnea, but it's definitely um, uh, bad for that, and it definitely promotes snoring. And this hadith here mentions that it is disliked by Allah, so um, we should try our best to avoid that. And uh, I'd like to end with a prescription from the sunnah. This is a prescription specifically for people who are suffering from grief, or sadness or depression, it's incredibly easy to make. And it's called Telbina. And Telbina is basically uh, barley with milk or a milk alternative if uh, you can't drink milk. And um, basically what you do is buy some barley, um, put it through a food processor um, if it's not already kind of like in a flour texture. And uh, then you basically just put it in a saucepan and essentially you cook it like porridge. You just cook it like oats, uh, bring the, you know, the heat up, let it boil and then reduce it and just put it on a light simmer for four minutes. And then you can eat it on its own or you can add any desired toppings on top. Honey dates would be a really good option. But this hadith here mentions that um, Talbina soothes the heart of the patient and relieves him from some of his sadness. So on that note, I'd like to uh, may, um, thank you again for your hospitality. I'd like to, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> I got my words confused then. I'd like to thank Isra for their hospitality and thank Isra for extending this uh, invitation um, for me to give this presentation. I have enjoyed preparing it and uh, there is so much more information to, to give. Um, and I, I ask that uh, may... Allah Azawajal Al Shifa, may He bless you with good health and your family. And uh, I think now we are going to open up for uh, questions. Jazakallah khaira. Thank you for that introduction. Um, so just to summarize what has been said, basically we went through different fruits, different remedies uh, that the Prophet Sallallahu based on uh, Quran and Hadith, but most of them, most of the examples were on Hadith. Our chat box is gone crazy with questions. So I'm going to start reading, start from the top and work my way down. And I've kind of sectioned the questions according to general, black seed, pregnancy and kids. So we'll start off with the general questions. Um, can you uh, give guidance on me? There's, uh, oh, and I'd also like to put a disclaimer as well. If questions are very specific and private, like feel free to, email um, Dr. Idris individually. So the questions that he'll be addressing today will be mainly um, gen general questions. If they're very specific to your case, as I said, it's best to email him privately. So I'll start off with the first question. Um, give us guidance on me. There is a bit of a tend to eat meat only diet, a trend. Uh, it appears to go against the practice of the Prophet Sallallahu who apparently only ate meat a few times a year and was mainly vegetarian. Yeah, we we don't know exactly how often um, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu and uh, the Sahaba consumed meat, but we do know that it was not common. Uh, we also know uh, by um, the words of Aisha that um, I'll be pleased with her, that um, uh, his household, uh, it could go months without the fire being lit to cook something. So it indicates that they also were, you know, they ate a lot of things raw. Um, I'm not suggesting meat was eaten raw, but um, 
Yeah, look, I think that, uh, again, uh, protein, look, proteins have their benefits, absolutely. And I'm a big believer in um, having sufficient protein. Um, but there needs to be a balance. I think, uh, again, if we look at typical um, Muslim cultures and Muslim families around the world, the plate is generally rice, bread, meat. Um, and there's not a lot of color and there's not a lot of veggies, veggies. So we want to kind of have that balance. And that's really essentially, I think, one of the things that we're taught in the Sunnah is to always follow the balance, the middle path, balancing what we eat, balancing what we drink, etc. <clears throat> Thanks for that. Definitely answers the question. Uh, okay, so when you were talking about the different fruits that the Prophet ﷺ used to eat, um, someone mentioned, what about sugar spikes associated with fruits and a lot of fructose content? So how do you make sure you have fruit in moderation, I guess? That's yeah, cool. that's true. Um, well, look, again, um, fructose, interestingly, onions and garlic uh, are very high in fructose. Um, and um, we've got fractans and fructose and galactans. We've got all these um, d different types of foods that can affect people. And that's generally because of a pre-existing problem. Uh, there's a condition called SIBO, for example, where people become very sensitive to certain types of foods like fructose. But on the most part, um, we've got to understand that these are whole foods, meaning that they don't just contain some natural sugars, which they do. They contain everything, uh, vitamins and minerals. So, again, I think it comes down to a balance. Um, definitely um, uh, a lot the Almighty has created vegetation for us to eat and there is Shifa in these foods. And, um, you know, I think uh, having them in combination with um, uh, everything else that we eat is is a good thing and I recommend it. Uh, again, coming back to eating that, um, that rainbow, a colourful plate of different foods is very important. Um, but like I said, the interesting part about you know, replying to your 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 question here is that um, some of the highest foods in fructose are onions and garlic, which, as we know, he disliked. So, um, so on and so on. That literally um, is one of the questions as well. Um, any reason why onions and garlic needs to be avoided? So, thank you for addressing that indirectly. <laughs> as well. um, I'm just conscious of the time. We have ten minutes and like twenty questions, so we'll try and power through as much as we can. Um, <laughs> Do you get? Do you still get the same level of antioxidant benefits of the skin, say from dried grapes? I think you mean sultanas or raisins. Is that what it's asking? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. No. Not exactly the same. Uh, fresh is best. Although there is goodness in the sultana or raisins, but uh, I believe the when it comes to um. Uh, the chemical that we're after, resveratrol, it's found in the fresh skin. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so does vinegar affect acid balance of the teeth for those prone to cavities? That's a very good question. So, um, yes, look, um, the acidic nature of vinegar, the pH is about 3.5. It's very acidic, um, which is why, number one, uh, you never want to really consume it completely raw, like in terms of drinking it. As I said before, the practice of the sunnah is to dip your bread in a little bit of vinegar, um, which, um, you know, I think a lot of cultures do things like this anyway. But um, you don't want to ever drink it directly. Um, we have enamel, which protects our teeth from cavities. And definitely if you're consuming vinegar a lot, um vinegar can um upset that that uh that balance a little bit however what's more important what i've found is that you see there's a test that we can do which looks at the environment of the mouth and a lot of people's mouths the you know the um the microbiome of their health of their the oral microbiome their oral health their ph is actually too alkaline so it's very, very rare. I've never actually come across people that have a, a very acidic mouth. It's normally the other way around. So, um, again, wisdom from the Sunnah that hopefully vinegar helps to balance um, the acidity in our oral health. <clears throat> All right, so the black seed questions are three. I'm going to just scoop them together. 
Um, could you recommend a black seed oil or brand for purchase that is most effective? And what's the best way to use black seed oil? Yeah, well, definitely, you know, I think as Australians, we want to support our own. Um, an excellent brand is Habshifa. Um, uh, it's locally owned and locally made. So that's an excellent one. And they do mention the pharmaquinic content. Sorry, what was the second part of the question? Um, so what's a good way to use black seed oil? Just drink it uh, in juice or on salads, <laughs> et cetera? Yeah, don't do what... So I have an assistant in my clinic and she made the mistake the other day. She got a glass, put black seed in it. And of course, what's going to happen? The oil and the water don't mix. So the oil sitting on the top and she's drinking it and she was going to dry reach <laughs> because it was really, it was getting really strong towards the end. So don't do that. Um, no, I, look, uh, black seed oil is used best in, in small doses because it is so strong. You can just eat it straight off the spoon. Um, I like me personally, I mix it with honey. I think that that's just the best combination. Um, and for those people who don't like the taste or a bit funny with an oil texture, you can buy the capsules. <clears throat> all right. So this next section of questions is all about kids and pregnancy. Um, so because we're speaking about the black seed, it's a good segue into this question. Is black seed safe to consume when pregnant or feeding? Mm. Interesting question. Um, there is a lack of evidence is pretty much what it comes down to. Uh, empirically, what I'd say, I understand that, that uh, I don't feel that there is a problem during pregnancy to take black seed in very small doses. Um, there's never been any study to say yes or no. So sometimes you might find that it has that warning, you know, this product has not been uh, studied for safety. But I believe that in very small doses, it is okay. Um, and uh, breastfeeding, yes, is, is a definite yes. But pregnancy, look, in the world of herbal medicine, uh, there's just a lack of research. That's what it comes down to. We only have about maybe six or seven herbs that we know for sure are safe during pregnancy. But um, black seed, in my opinion, is in small doses, uh, inshallah, safe. Beautiful. Um, so uh, it says here, why is that honey not allowed for kids below the age of one? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Look, honey, particularly if it's unfiltered and raw, which, to be honest, is actually the best way to buy your honey. You should always try and buy local honey that's raw and unfiltered. But um, just because of the nature of honey, there can be a particular type of um, toxic ingredient that can be in honey uh, for uh, children under one. It's um, look, it's it, there was a situation once, I believe, where a child had some type of a, um, a bad reaction. And because a child's immunity is still developing, uh, that's the main reason why it's recommended not to do so. But, you know, again, you can use this wisdom with discretion. I think probably from six months onwards, um, small doses are OK. Uh, but that's really why, the, the, you know, we're taught to avoid it. Uh, under 12 months to protect them in the case and the unlikely case that there's a uh, ingredient which is not harmful to us but um, can be harmful to, for little kids, um, newborns, I should say. Uh, is it safe to fast when breastfeeding? Um, well, when you're, when you're breastfeeding, you actually need more calories than when you're pregnant. You need about 750 calories more. Um, it's, I think it really comes down to personal choice and knowing your own body. If you feel that you've got a good milk supply and if you know you're going to do, you know, you might not fast exactly how I recommended just before where you have a really small support. You, I think you're probably going to have to have more. It's definitely safe. It's not unsafe. Um, especially because you're not pregnant, right? You're just breastfeeding. The worst that can happen is if you're not eating enough uh, calories and nutrition, your supply will go down. So um, definitely be mindful of that. Um, but yeah, you're probably going to have to fast a little smarter. You might have to have like a, a second meal, a second iftar, for example, just to make sure your calories are up. But um, inshallah, it's, it's definitely safe. Okay, so we have literally two minutes and five questions. We spoke a lot about female stuff, so let's uh, talk about male stuff. Is black seed oil suitable for those with prostate issues? 
Um, yeah, there's no evidence why it wouldn't be. In fact, I would probably say that uh, thymoquine in some shape or form uh, could be really beneficial for prostate problems. Um, I'm not aware of any research specifically on this, but um, it's definitely, again, it clearly says in the in the hadith that it's a shifa for all illness except death. So um, I think the answer is yes, right? Jazakallah <laughs> Well, thank you so much for showering us with your knowledge. This has been amazing. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to tell us a little bit about the work that you do at all or where, can, where if someone wanted to um, ha uh, be, like, ask you for consultancy or visit your clinic? Sure. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, look, I, I, um, I, am, uh, I am at a clinic here in Melbourne. Um, I'm part of the Organic Instinct um, group, so my clinic is in that building, which is in Melbourne. People for familiar with Melbourne is just kind of uh, behind HIYC in that area. Um, I consult in person, so you can come and see me in person, or I consult online. So if you happen to be elsewhere in the world, um, and that happens a lot, uh, I'll see patients from different countries or from Sydney or uh, what have you. Um, yeah, look. Um, uh, as naturopaths, we really uh, struggle with time. Um, I mean, I'm very busy, alhamdulillah. So um, if you had a, you know, a concern um, and, and you really needed some assistance with it, then book an appointment. So the, probably the easiest way to reach us is on Instagram. Um, we're unable to spend a lot of time going through everyone's question like now, um, particularly sometimes people write me these long essays um, ultimately, the the answer that you'll get is come and come and book an appointment um, uh, because to give medical advice is a touchy thing. We need to obviously get the big picture. So um, yeah, the the clinic is called the Sunnah Doctor. You're more than welcome. Um, the there's two types of appointments. Um, the first is a initial appointment, which is an hour. We go through everything in your health, and we put together a treatment plan to help and serve you, and and to improve your health. And then there's just a really short appointment that's 15 minutes for people that just have like a, a one-off small issue that they need some assistance with. Um, definitely different to seeing a GP. Uh, we've got all sorts of tests that we can arrange, um, functional medicine tests, et cetera. But uh, yeah, the Sunna doctor, you can uh, book yourself an appointment and uh, be more than happy to assist and show up. Wonderful. Now, before we leave, I was just wondering if I could get a show of hands, if you could raise your hands, if you're interested in for us to organize um, in collaboration with Dr. Idris, an on-site workshop. Um, so if you're interested in like uh, registering for an on-site workshop, um, we're just trying to suss our interests and hopefully it could be more in-depth because what you got is just a small capsule of um, knowledge um, and inshallah, we're hoping to do like a weekend intensive or a one day. Um, and the more hands we get, the more encouragement <laughs> we'll get to obviously run this thing, which is great. Okay. Eight out of 64. That's not too bad. Nine. <laughs> okay. 10%. Not bad. Not bad. Um, I'd just also like to quickly show you some of our upcoming events as well. At Isra, alhamdulillah, we're very, very busy. Um. Okay. Don't know why that came up. Uh, we're very, very busy, but uh, nonetheless, if you're in Sydney, there's a lovely nature walk at Olympic Park for sisters, just a beautiful social gathering for sisters to come together and exercise. Mm. Um, there's the five-week parenting essentials program. There's a few uh, professionals involved in that. It's really exciting. This is the first time we run it online. So we have mm. Khadija Kadua, Rans, uh, Siddiqui, Junaid, Sheikh Warsama, um, we have the public speaking intensive as well, comes around once a year. We're really excited to have the brother, uh, David, who is a Toastmasters um, expert, mm. alhamdulillah. I did that, actually. Oh, no way. How did you find it? You can test, test you can give us a live testimony. <laughs> well, maybe. I don't know. It depends. How did I do tonight? <laughs> <laughs> Great. Fantastic. Um, I was captivated personally. <laughs> look, no, I, I, he's a, mashallah, he's a wonderful brother and I really enjoyed it. And, um, you know, you guys are just are doing so many things, not only just as the, 
you know, obviously you've got the, uh, the 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 short courses like this, and of course then also the university courses, mashallah. So it's uh, you do you doing excellent things. Alhamdulillah. Well, we couldn't do it without like those in community who are experts in their field, like yourself as well. Um, you're a great contribution to our community, so we appreciate all the work that you do, and we can't wait to bring this future course into fruition as well um there's also uh, i'll just scroll really really quickly death and dying for those in sydney um faith future and exploring modern challenges of youth for those in sydney as well um yeah that's pretty much our programs we do have a question i sorry we can't answer your question because we're out of time but i do encourage you guys to email us um can we share screenshots of this session well this this will um, this is a recorded session, so I personally don't have a problem with it, but I'll ask uh, Dr. Idris, do you mind That's right. <laughs> share and exchange information? Awesome, beautiful. Well, you guys will receive uh, the recorded session for you to review later. And I'm not sure about the PowerPoint, but you can still watch the recorded session. All right. Enjoy the rest of your night and inshallah you'll be able to implement the knowledge you learned into your daily practice. Have a lot of fruits, have a lot of uh, honey, have tambina, cure depression. Who yeah. knew? SubhanAllah. Yeah. Okay, take care. Assalamu alaikum, guys. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.